Madame Lagarde, good afternoon. We are very excited to have you here joining good with afternoon. us. We are very excited to have you joining us for this uh, summit. I know that you have your hands full, uh, but first of all, would you like to give us an out outlook of the global economy? I will be very happy to do that, but let me just say how pleased I am to be with the 900 women in the audience and to be interviewed by you because you are a remarkable uh, role model uh, yourself and, and a success story that is, is really uh, to be admired. You've asked me a very serious question, which has to do with the economic outlook. Uh, what, what does the world uh, look today? And let me just take in turn the various uh, group of economies as we see them from, from, the venture the, from the vintage point that I have the privilege of enjoying uh, here at the Fund. If we look at the advanced economies, uh, there is clearly slower growth than we expected only a few months ago. And that slow growth is clearly fueled by a lack of confidence, by this uh, sovereign debt crisis that we see uh, lurking in the background, in the periphery, but also moving into the center of Europe, and by uh, clear balance sheet issues that concerns both uh, banks, households, uh, in most advanced economies. This is not specific to Europe. This is also the case in the United States. If we now turn to the emerging markets, uh, where growth is better, where the numbers uh, clearly are, have improved a lot faster uh, in the course of the recovery. There is also a risk in the emerging markets. Why is that? Not so much because of the cold winds that are sort of blowing in the face of the advanced economies, but because of overheating risks, whether it's inflation, whether it's credit. Uh, on all those fronts, the emerging markets are also at risk. And they will be suffering as a result of uh, the slow growth in the advanced economies because what we are seeing uh, in all the studies that we've conducted lately is the very strong interconnectedness. Now strong interconnectedness can be good but it can also be a serious risk when part of the world is, is really exposed uh, to serious threats. Now I, I would not want to conclude uh, without mentioning two uh, other groups of countries. One is the, what we call the low-income countries uh, that clearly are vulnerable and most exposed, not so much because of the commodity prices that suffer significant volatility, but also because of what is currently affecting the advanced economies. In other words, whatever happens to the advanced economies is going to have ripple effects on emerging markets where the demand that is addressed to them by way of exports, for instance, is going to suffer but also on the low-income countries simply because those that export commodities are going to take a hit as a result and those that import commodities will suffer as well. Now, you will say this is very gloomy all in all, but first of all, I think that there is a way out of that situation. And there is a way out if nations, if governments decide to take collective bold action rapidly. Well, you truly represent diversity in such an institution as IMF. Not only are you the first female managing director of this institution, but also you are a trained lawyer to head a team of over 2,500 economists. Uh, what steps are you going to take to promote diversity uh, in IMF, both uh, to its staff and to its ideas? You know, I had a bit of the same issue when I was uh, the chairman of Baker McKenzie, which was a, which is a, a very large international law firm, which has offices in many places of the world, and uh, you know, the legal business is is essentially male dominated as well. There are multiple ways to support diversity and to encourage it. Uh, first of all, I think one has to sort of lead from from the top and demonstrate and constantly convince that uh, being a woman, 
not being from the, the, the mainstream, so to speak, uh, is, is okay. And, and you can still do the job. And you can do it decently, reasonably well, um, encouraging people around you and encouraging women around you. Uh, second, and this is the case uh, with the fund, uh, you can decide that there will be targets, that by a certain period in the coming years, you will reach 20, 30, 40 percent of women in the organization. And this is what we've set for ourselves at the fund. Now, we have to deal with a, a, a dual challenge, one of the gender, but also one about origins. And the second target that we have set for ourselves is that we need to reach by 2015 40 percent of diversity at all staff level. And, and that's, I know, is going to be a challenge, but it needs to be driven from the top and throughout the organization. It's, it's not a trivial matter. That's the message that I constantly um, repeat and, and reiterate because it has to, you know, be channeled through the organization to its lowest level, but starting from the top. Well, there have been many firsts in your professional career in both private and public sectors. But I learned that your first job application was actually turned down because you're a woman. What was your reaction to that? Pack up and go. Sorry, was there a similar feeling brought back to you when you were interviewed for your current job by 23 men and only one woman on the executive board of IMF? Well, you know what, Young, the, the, the worst thing is that that only woman executive director at the IMF who is representing the United States of America, uh, Meg, was not actually uh, at the final board session, because for that, on that particular day, she had to attend another very important meeting. So I was with 24 boys. <laughs> now, I didn't pack and go. I thought diversity has to not only be lip service, but also demonstrated at all levels of the organization. And I will do my best uh, to make sure that that happens. I can't do much of anything at the board level because executive directors are appointed by uh, member states. And, you know, I don't have a say. But it looks a bit funny, a group of 23 plus one. Global traveling has become a lifestyle for many career women. And how did you manage that when you were chairman of Baker McKenzie? You work in the headquarters in Chicago while raising two young children in Paris and taking care of another more than 60 offices worldwide. How did you do that to be a superwoman? No, no, no. I was, I was very lucky to be surrounded by very supportive women. Uh, one of them was my mother. Uh, another one was a, a wonderful uh, nanny who helped me throughout, who was um, not a carrier woman herself, but who took great uh, pleasure and pride in supporting me. And uh, she's a friend for life. Um, you are known for straight talking, but you know sometimes making decisions doesn't always make you more popular. Uh, when you were the Minister of Trade and Minister of Finance in France, um, some of your policy suggestions were turned down. How did you swallow your pride and carry on? Well, y you're right. There were occasions when I proposed um, policies, measures, instruments that were not approved, that, you know, did not carry the day. It's okay, you know, it's part of being on a team and it's part of trying and eventually trying harder. And, uh, you know, I, I swallowed my pride, I uh, wrapped up my file and uh, got on with other things that I had to do. But, you know, it's not short of having tried and it's certainly not short of trying harder 
the next time around because I think that one of the basic principles that certainly I've you know sort of tried throughout my life is never give up just keep at it and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but we should never give up totally agree you must hate the question uh, to compare different leadership styles between men and women but on the decision-making table, do women bring some new perspectives and insights like they are more inclusive or team-oriented? No, um, I, I don't hate the question, but it's, uh, it's a difficult one because it's hard to compare men and women when there are so many men in most organizations and so few women. My experience of having worked with both men and women is that women tend to bring a more inclusive, more embracing, uh, more, you would probably call it holistic view of issues and, and, uh, and, and questions and problems. Uh, that's what I have experienced personally with, with many of them. Um, and my experience of it is that we tend to bring not just the professional side of things, but also uh, the human dimension. You began your presentation by talking about your grandmother. And I think it touches all of us because you relate to a chain of women before you. And, and you bring that humanity that is in both men and women, but that we tend not to um, you know, sort of hide and, and, and protect as if it was a sign of weakness. I think it's a sign of inclusion. It's a sign of openness. It's a sign of, you know, I'm like you, you are like me, and we have a history. And, and we owe to those before us. Well, women are making um, a lot of contributions to the economic change, not just to the growth or economic recovery, but also to the changes of patterns of thinking and the behavior. Well, uh, in, the, uh, in terms of the financial crisis we just experienced, uh, could it have made a difference if more women were involved in the leadership in the sector of investment and finance? <laughs> Three things. Um, you're right in saying that uh, women play a much bigger role than before. There are areas where I think we need to collectively see how we can encourage more engagement by women. And I will mention two examples of that. One is in the, in the microcredit sector, particularly in low-income countries, where women are the most engaged, uh, the best possible um, beneficiary of, of microcredits, the best one to refund uh, microcredit and to honor their commitment. The second area is one example that I will take from my previous experience as Minister of Economy and Finance in France. We put together a scheme that was pretty much a self-employed type of status where anybody could actually uh, set up his or her own business and only pay taxes and social security contributions and all the rest of it if and when business was coming in and if uh, the business was registering uh, sales and turnover. Now, believe it or not, many, many women actually took up the opportunity. It was simple, straightforward, only costly, in other words, having to pay charges, if you actually made business. And of those many women who took up the opportunity, a huge majority of them actually succeeded. And it was open to all, but women took up the opportunity and women turned it into a success story. Now, you pointed me in the direction of the financial sector in particular. And yes, I believe that a more uh, diverse environment with a better balance between genders is more conducive to a less charged environment. I have seen trading rooms and I might upset a few boys. That's okay, I can cope with it. I think a more balanced environment is better for, you know, more thinking, more rational uh, behind decisions. Thank you very much. And um, if there's one message you want to give to girls growing up to realize their potentials, what would that be? You can do it, girl. <laughs>